read um, some scripture real quick. Why don't y'all read this with us? It says, give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord. None are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are good. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Thank you. 
Christ, we've been redeemed, we have hope, we have a sure foundation to carry us through whatever life may bring. Lord, we thank you for the grace that you have poured out upon our life. It is amazing grace. Lord, we pray your blessing on chapel. We pray, Father, that you would anoint and inspire, and Father, that the Holy Spirit but have great freedom now, and we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. It is my distinct honor and pleasure this morning to introduce our chapel speaker. He is an strategist, an educator, a coach, but above all, he is a Christ follower, and he's our new president. And brother, we have prayed for you and are behind you. And look forward to hearing what you have to say to us today. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I mean, can I just say that uh, the Spirit of the Lord is in this place? You sense that? That's, that's fabulous worship time. I mean, that is the best chapel band singers in America. Right there, ladies and gentlemen. And... Uh, so it's great to see you this morning. Is it really well with your soul? Think about that for a minute. I, I spoke a few weeks ago at the athletic banquet, or football banquet, and had a great time, great experience. And I told a little story about my, my cousin. And then from time to time, I'll, I'll kind of bring you into my family, which is very unique, very colorful family. Um, most of them are now out of jail. Not my, not my immediate family, I'm talking distant relatives, but uh, in particular, my cousin Vernon. And some of you at the football banquet, just if you heard the story, you'll laugh again, maybe, and maybe you'll tell someone who doesn't get it how, what it's all about. But Vernon T. Brewer IV lives in Waycross, Georgia. Anybody here from Waycross, Georgia? Good, I can tell this story. And so, um, Vernon, in our family, I came from a family, a long line of they were either pastors or educators or business people. And my dad was a pastor. He's passed on. He's home with the Lord now. My uncles that were pastors, they've gone on to be with the Lord. I had cousins that were ministers. They've gone on to be with the Lord except for one. So in my family, I'm about the only one left. So if there's a wedding, a funeral, or any theological question, I get called or emailed about it. Vernon's a good old boy, a farmer down there in Waycross, Georgia. And of course, you know why they call it Waycross, Georgia, because it's way across Georgia. But uh, Vernon, he called me recently. He said, he said Rick, um, someone put this uh, magazine on the door of, my, of the house, and, uh, and, and they said that they would come back a little later to discuss it with me. I said, well, Vernon, what's the magazine called? He said, well, it's called The Watchtower. I said, well, Vernon, you don't want none of that. Let me just tell you. You don't want none of that. In, in fact, let me tell you something about those folks. They're good people, but they don't quite believe, they're not quite people of the book, and they have some unusual positions. Particularly, they don't believe in pledging allegiance to the flag. They don't believe in being patriotic. Vernon stopped me right there because he's a former Marine. He said, that's enough for me, brother. That's enough for me. I'll be ready. Because they had placed a note, you see, that said, we're going to be back in a couple weeks to talk with you. And so... Uh, a little time went by, and one day a nice lady got out of her car with a briefcase, and she comes up the sidewalk, rings the doorbell. Vernon looks at his wife and three beautiful young daughters and says, oh, she's here. We're ready. And let the nice lady in the, in the house, she comes in. She says, oh, I'm so glad you invited me in. So good to see you, your family. I just had some things I want to share with you. And as she sets a briefcase down, Vernon goes, wait just a minute. We have a custom in our family that... Anytime any folk come over, any visitors come over, that we're going to go over here and pledge allegiance to the flag. <laughs> so over their fireplace had draped this big, huge American flag. So Vernon and his wife and the three girls, they stand there, I pledge allegiance to it. And they do the whole thing. And the nice lady, she kind of chimes in. Well, now, sir, let me get to what I came to talk to you about. Well, no, 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 ma'am, wait just a minute. In our family, not only do we pledge the flag, but we sing the national anthem. They sang all three verses of the national anthem. And so nine minutes later, <laughs> in perfect harmony, 
Vern's a good singer, his wife, the kids, all great. This is great. We'll bring them over here sometime. No, we won't. So, uh, so uh, Vernon and all, you know, and he they have a wonderful time and they sing and, and they sit down. And then Vernon looks at the lady right now and says, now, ma'am, what is it you come to talk to us about? She says, sir, I got to honestly tell you, in my 23 years of selling Avon, I've never met the most patriotic family in America. <laughs> so, so uh, pray for Vernon. Here's the connection to the message. That's kind of frustrating. In the, in the talk today, there's some notes you got when you came in. I hope you'll take notes because here's what I believe as an educator. You know, what you see, what you hear, what you write down, what you tell someone else, what you meditate upon, what you maybe teach someone. Now, we know as educators that maybe we've got you up to 80 to 90 percent retention. But what you just hear today and walk out, you may retain only 10, 15 percent at best. But you write it down, you think about it, you meditate on it, you share it with someone. We're going to move that up a bit. So God, I believe, has something for us today. And so if you'll take your note out, the little blue sheet we gave when you came in and follow along. And we're going to talk about today, what do you do? How do you respond when you believe in your heart that you are firmly in the center of God's will, yet nothing, nothing in the flesh, nothing on the surface appears to be going your way? I mean, it all should be going perfect. You've done everything you're supposed to do. You believe your destiny is headed in that direction. You believe you're walking in God's will. You're walking in his favor, but yet nothing seems to be going your way. What do you do? How do you respond? Well, that's kind of frustrating, isn't it? Frustration for us, you'll see it on, the, on here, uh, is here's a working definition for us. When your expectation and reality clash. When what you expect and what is real clash, like some of you young ladies, you meet a guy, you think he's just the answer to it all, and you take him home at Thanksgiving to introduce him to your parents, and you go, hey, old Freddie here, he's, got a, he's working on a PhD. And you come to find out in the course of conversation at the Thanksgiving dinner that Freddie says the PhD stands for Pizza Hut Dude. Well, that's frustrating. You know, that's frustrating. Anybody here ever deal with frustration? Anyone here would say the source of that frustration is sitting beside you? No, don't, don't go there today. Don't do that. No, I don't do that. I mean, it's kind of like driving down one of these little two-lane roads back in the country, and you can't pass because all the logging trucks and all the farm trucks and the tractors come on the other side, and this fellow in front of you driving his 1962 Mercury has his left turn signal on, and it's on for 17 miles. That's frustrating. I mean, I don't want to know, I don't know, want to know where you're turning. I just want to know when, you know, that's frustrating. Well, we take this and there's so many places we could go in scripture and talk about men and women who were placed in frustrating times. But God places us in a season, in a time, in a stage of frustration. Well, I particularly like the story of Joseph. Now, those of you who've had Dr. Shepard's Old Testament class, you know all this stuff, Right? Right? Right, okay, good. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to this morning assume you understand old Joseph back in chapter 37 of Genesis. You know, he's one of the, one of the young men, one of those guys, one of the sons of Jacob. He has the amazing technicolor coat. He can interpret dreams. He's kind of cocky. He's kind of arrogant. He goes out one day and talks to his brothers and he tells them a dream and basically interprets the dream because God given him the gift of interpretation. And so he interprets the dream and in the process, the brothers realize, the older brothers realize that this young little kid is telling us that one day we're going to bow down to him. Anybody here have younger brothers? Yeah, I was the oldest of three. If my youngest brother, who's seven years younger than me, when he was 13, if he'd have come to me and said, Rick, one day you're going to bow down and kiss my ring, yeah, right. <laughs> he'd have kissed, he'd have kissed, my ring would have kissed him. No, no, that's not going to happen. And so they begin to set out to conspire to get rid of young Joey. And you go over to chapter, in the end of chapter 37, you see that, well, they think they might kill him. Then they said, no, we're going to throw him in a pit. And then a brother says, we're going to get some money for him. They sell him off some Midianite traders. And then the Midianite traders take him to Egypt. And this Hebrew boy is now placed in an alien land. And you pick the story up in chapter 39. In chapter 39, something wonderful happens and something bad kind of happens. Young Joseph, and this is a fundamental principle of Scripture, 
You see it in several verses, 2, 3, 21, 23 in chapter 39. It has this phrase repeated, the Lord was with him. Is there any finer words could be said about you or me? The Lord was with him. The Lord was with her. The Lord was with you. The Lord is with you. And because of that, a basic fundamental principle of Scripture, God is always looking for men and women of conscience, of character, of conviction, of integrity, of commitment. And he wants to take those people wherever they are in society, wherever they are in the culture, and raise them to a level of influence to impact that culture, to impact and influence that world. That's why I am passionate about Christian higher education. We have the chance, we have the opportunity to send you, to launch you into the world, to go into Kuiper's seven cultural venues, seven cultural mountains, and rise and ascend, earn the right to be heard, and transform the world for the kingdom of God. Amen? To be a part of the redemptive and restorative process. That's why I'm passionate about it. And just a side note, oh, by the way, I love being your president. I love being here, okay? Yeah. And I'll love it more when my wife gets here. <laughs> okay? You guys pray. We put our house on the market Monday. We've had three people look at it already. Just pray it sells quickly. And we, we get my, my wife Kathy here. But, but God is wanting to do that in your life. He's looking. And so in Joseph's life, it happens. Potiphar picks up on that, that there's something different about him. And he gives him a role of leadership. And he leaves. Now, Potiphar's wife. Kind of psychotic. She has some issues. She makes some sexual advances towards young Joseph because the scripture says, Dr. Caples, that he was handsome. He was good looking. Kind of like what they said about you and Marvin and I years ago. Many, many years ago. But uh, I, I digress, of course. Uh, and so he runs away. He does what we should do when we're faced with temptation. What do we do? We flee it. On well, the process, he course, humiliates her. When the husband comes back, she paints the story just the opposite and convicts, convinces Potiphar that that man, the, that servant, that guy you hired, Joseph, he tried, to do, he tried to seduce me. Well, Potiphar believes her, so he throws him into a pit. So Joseph's in a pit in 37. Now he's in a pit in chapter 40. Now in your Bibles, go to chapter 40 in Genesis quickly. That's not a chapter in the Bible that you normally go probably in your quiet time. But in chapter 40, Joseph is there and he's in prison. He's in a pit once again. So some things emerge as I read this passage and follow me in your notes. The first thing, how do you get through a season of frustration? Number one, you must recognize this frustration as God's course of preparation. God's course of preparation. The call of God is always a call to prepare. Whenever God begins to do what he wants to do in your life, when we can come to that place of praying as Christ prayed, not my will, but thine be done. For God to prepare us, for God to equip us, for God to refine us, he has to take us through a season of frustration. He may have to restrict us. You see, Joseph is overqualified to be where he is. He's an innocent man. Not only is he an innocent man, but who is his daddy? Jacob. Who's his granddaddy? Isaac. Who's his great-granddaddy? Abraham. He doesn't belong in an Egyptian prison. We'll come back to that. Early on, he was God's man. He was the dreamer. But there came a time, a moment, when God's man had to become a man of God. And there may be, we may be at a point at Louisiana College, when Louisiana College as a people of God, and God's people here have to become the people of God. And to do that, we may go through a time of frustration. Second thing, God places in a time of frustration to get us to respond creatively. Joseph may have been a little arrogant, maybe a little self-centered, maybe a little vindictive. And early on, he had some rough edges that needed refining. And you see him there in, in verse 3 of chapter 40. It says, after they had been 
uh, excuse me, go up to verse 30, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. Now, he's in prison with a cupbearer and the baker. The cupbearer and the baker evidently had offended Pharaoh, and he threw them in this prison, and they are there with him. But look down at verse 7. In verse 6, when Joseph came to them, the cupbearer and baker the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? The first thing young Joseph learned during his season of frustration, he learned to get his attention and his eyes off himself, and he learned to serve other people. You see, Someone who is arrogant, someone who is self-centered, someone who is vindictive will never seek to serve anybody but themselves. And God wants you to respond creatively. In other words, the old ways won't work. God is wanting to get us to a place where we will respond in a way we did not know we had in us. Joseph didn't know that he could take care of other people till he went through chapter 40. And oftentimes in a season of frustration, we want to cry out. We want to throw what I call a huge pity party. Say, God, you must be angry with me. God, you must be just getting even with me. I'm not happy. I don't want this. Get me out. Under the second point, write these words. It's very important that you pass through this stage of frustration with dignity. Aren't you so glad the scripture says it came to pass and it didn't come to stay? And we're going through the valley because there's good stuff on the other side. So respond creatively. Don't throw a huge fit to God. Pass through it with dignity. Joseph couldn't respond arrogantly or selfishly and successfully move through chapter 40. And so God places us in a stage and a time and a season of frustration to learn things about ourselves we couldn't learn any other way. The only way to get to chapter 41 where great things that happen is to go through 40. Well, here's the, here's the third thing that emerges. You must refuse to compromise. God is wanting to use you. God is wanting to prepare you. God is wanting to refine you. And while in prison, Joseph interprets dreams. These guys had dreams. They come to him. They're confused. He, he asks them why they're sad. They tell them why they're sad. And he says, well, you know, I serve a God who can interpret dreams. And instead of compromising, Joseph tells the truth because for one guy, it's going to turn out good. And for the other guy, it isn't going to be so good. The biggest reason you and I will compromise in a chapter 40 experience is for comfort, for convenience. You know, you say, I'm tired of hurting. I'm tired of it not going my way, and I'm ready to get it over, and I'm ready to be comfortable again. God, give me patience and give it to me now. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. So you'd see old Joseph struggling. Look in verses 14 and 15. So he's telling, he's telling the cupbearer, it's going to go good for you. You're going to be restored to your position. And look in verse 14. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. And then verse 15 becomes his resume. It's his bio. This is his CV. This is his defense. He says, for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon, in a pit, in a prison. You know what I say Joseph's doing there? He's doing what I do. He's doing what you do. We try to work it for God a little bit. Just work it for him. Look, God, you can't handle this. You really don't know what you're doing, God, so I'm going to help you. God, I'm going to remind you of who I am. I'm a part of your chosen generation, God. Certainly you can get this over with quickly, and we try to work it for God. And all that conniving and all that conspiring and all that intellect didn't work out good for him because he spends two more years in prison, long, dull monotonous alone two years see the greatest temptation in the stage of frustration is we try to speed the process up lord get on with it come on god speed this thing up and we try to work it for god the danger of compromising in a season of frustration is this you prolong that frustration God doesn't go, hey, yeah, Dr. Rick, you're right. What do I know? Yeah, yeah, Rick, you know how to run your life better than I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you prolong it. 
Joseph goes, tell him I'm innocent. Plead for me on my behalf. And nothing happens. Why do I know that? You look at the very last verse of chapter 40. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. You see, God did not need Joseph's help. He doesn't need your help. You got to trust him. You got to trust him. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen? You got to trust him. And that's the point where we begin to grow in our walk and our fellowship of Christ is when we can come to that place, say, not my will, but yours, Lord. I trust you. I trust you in the process. I trust you as I'm becoming more Christ-like, more Christ-minded, more Christ-centered. I trust you, Lord, as you're taking me through what we love to call in our biblical theological understanding this process of sanctification. I trust you, Lord. He doesn't need your help. And one of the things you must do in this stage is refuse to compromise. Don't sell out. The next thing that comes to my mind, it surfaces, emerges not only must we respond creatively and refuse to compromise, but fourthly, we must request courage. Something happened to Joseph between verses 15 and 16. It's not written about. We kind of read between the lines. They've kidnapped me, thrown him here. He's forgotten. All of his scheming did not work, and the cupbearer gets out of prison, totally forgets him. Somewhere in the two years of Joseph's life in chapter 40, I believe, instead of him requesting, God, get me out of here. I don't need this stuff. I don't have to put up with this, which is most of us would be saying, I believe somewhere in those two years, Joseph stopped, requested freedom and started requesting courage. Courage. I love that word. I love words. <laughs> yeah. That word comes from a French word, courir, which is about the heart. C.S. Lewis says, if you're going to communicate with courage, your heart will be tested. Have you had your heart tested lately? If not, you're not speaking, you're not living, you're not communicating in courage. His plea changed from, I'm innocent, to God, please help me to stay where you want me to stay. So God places Joseph in prison in his perfect, permissive will. He places him. He's no longer a favored son or honored servant. And for two years, he had to see himself the way God saw him. And in a season of frustration, God is restricting, knocking the rough edges off so we can know ourselves the way he knows us. And if you are going to successfully move through a time of frustration, you must recognize this as God's course of preparation. He's getting you ready for something unbelievable beyond what you could ever imagine or think. So Joseph couldn't get to chapter 41 until he had those rough edges off. And he couldn't become eventually the second in control, the second in power, the prime minister of Egypt until he could see himself apart from his success, apart from his status. And that is true for every one of us in this building, from the PhDs to the ones who hope to just graduate. Thank you, Lordy. God restricts us to prepare us. So God places us. Time of frustration. Write this down. Here's the question. Am I willing to stay long enough to come through this. Most of us quit in the middle. Don't compromise when it make you more comfortable. Don't quit. Decide today not to quit. This may be the very turning point for many of you in this building today. Stop requesting freedom and start requesting courage. Courage. God, give me the courage not to quit. Oh, I love what C.S. Lewis says about God's megaphone. When we're going through difficult times, when we're experiencing pain on multiple levels, he said, God whispers in our pleasures. God speaks in our conscience, but God shouts <laughs> in our pain. And God may be shouting to you today, don't quit, don't give up. Keep moving forward. Keep pressing on. Be courageous. And fifth, you got to reject condemnation. You see what happens. He's totally forgotten. 
And in a stage of frustration, condemnation can come, and you can think that it's over, and you can just think, well, you know, trusting God just isn't working out. I mean, I'm trusting God, but it isn't working out like those uh, TV evangelists say it's supposed to work out, you know? As if God's in a box. If you do this, he's going to do that. And especially if you send me money, you're not going to get wealthy, but the TV evangelist gets wealthy. I mean, just saying. <laughs> but this is something our generation, I think, needs to hear because we're very felt need oriented. You know, we think, well, I'll trust God and it's going to pay off right away, right immediately. I'll trust him and he's going to do something really good for me. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. He's already done everything good he ever needed for you back at the cross 2,000 years ago. He's already done it. We appropriate it. We walk in it. We breathe it. We live it. We follow his word. We read the word earlier. I ask for us to do that today. In fact, every time we have chapel, we will read the word together because the word is alive. It is transformational. And it really burdened me that you mumbled when you did that. I'm going to chastise you for a minute, okay? You mumbled. We're reading the word of God and we're lining up with eternity. We're talking about the God of the universe, not a box of M&Ms. I love you. you know, I wouldn't say that if I didn't love you. I want us to shout the word of God together. There's power in the word, amen? Here's Joseph in the center of God's will, exactly where God wants him, and nothing, nothing, nothing is going Joseph's way. So, write this down. In the season of frustration, your feelings are real, but they're just not always right. Now, what you feel in pain, what you feel in desperation, what he must have felt in being alone in a dungeon in a pit for two years, that was very real. Absolutely, but he just didn't need to trust his feelings. He needed to trust in the God of the universe and Jehovah God. So if you're going to get to chapter 41, where everything wonderful happens, you've got to go through 40. It's not 40 and a half. It's not 40 and three quarters. It's 40 to the end. And finally, once you've responded creatively, refused to compromise, request courage, reject condemnation, now you are ready to conquer. There's a benefit to getting through chapter 40. God had to get Joseph to see himself outside his favorite son, outside his status. God is getting you ready to conquer. And look what happens in chapter 41 over there in verses 38 and 39. What a glorious picture. When Pharaoh says that, well, let me give you the background just a second. I think you know this, but real quickly, the Pharaoh has some dreams. He's disturbed by the dreams he has. And he asks, he brings in all his chief guards, his leaders, his smart people. And he says, I've had this dream. I'm disturbed by it. I can't get over it. I need some help interpreting it. And they all go, we don't know how to interpret. We don't know what it means. Well, the cupbearer, remember he was restored? He's over in the wings and he's listening. Now, he's this little weaselly, wimpy guy. But he finds, ah, i got a chance to earn some favor with Pharaoh. Oh, Pharaoh, you remember when I upset you a while back and you put me in a prison oh, about two and a half years ago? I don't want to go there again, but, you know, you remember? Yeah. What about it? Well, I met a guy there because I had some strange dreams. He interpreted them, and the dream came true. Pharaoh says, well, get that fellow here now. They bring Joseph out of prison. Now, what kind of day must that have been for young Joey? They opened it up. He hadn't seen the sunlight in two years. This is the day. <laughs> and he walks through there, and Pharaoh says, here's my dream. Now, those of us in this room that love strategy and business, and I love teaching business and those things, he was, the, he was besides the Lord, he's probably the second major strategic planner in Scripture. Because he interprets a dream, and the dream is this. Pharaoh, there's going to be seven years of feast, seven years of prosperity, followed by seven years of famine in all the world. And guess what? I've got insider information. 
And if you'll follow this plan, we can put stuff away, we can store it away so that when the rest of the world is in famine, there will be a major issue of supply demand. We will have the supply, they will have the demand, and we can sell to them and be even more prosperous. Pharaoh says, this guy is wonderful. He gives him his signet ring. He makes him the prime minister. And he says, whatever he puts his hand to is law. Now, you tell me there isn't a God who can take a Hebrew boy and make him the prime minister of Egypt. And so Pharaoh says, there's a divine spirit in this man. Let me tell you this in closing. I believe that divine spirit was forged in the crucible of chapter 40, without a doubt. So three things we learn. God's ways are wisest. God's time is best. And God's grace is sufficient. You know the rest of the story. You go to the last chapter of Genesis. And you find this incredible reunion with his brothers. They haven't seen him in probably 20-some years he reveals himself to them, and they're thinking, oh, my, he is going to kill us. And what does he say in chapter 50, verse 20? You intended to harm me, but God <laughs> intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. What a marvelous picture of grace, forgiveness, redemption, restoration. We know that the Old Testament is type and shadow of the new and the new covenant. Well, let me close with this prayer this morning. If you're a believer here today and you're going through a season of frustration, it's because God is restricting you, refining you, equipping you, preparing you for something awesome. If you're here today and you're not following Christ, the reason that you're experiencing frustration is because of sin, because you're not in a relationship with the God who made you. So would you pray with me? Lord, we, we know that uh, as believers, those of us here today, that we may be facing frustration. And you know what area it is, Lord. I don't know for each person here, but you do. And maybe everything within us wants to quit. The day as best as we know how we request courage. Jesus, give me the courage to stay, to come all the way through this so I can get to my own personal chapter 41 where I can experience an incredible presence and work in my life from you, Lord. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, not a follower of Christ, we're glad you're here. You're checking this thing out. We want you to come to know Christ. We want you to become a part of the family. Say, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. As best as I know how, I, I ask you to forgive me and I give you control of my life. Jesus, step out of heaven. Step into my heart. Thank you for giving me a chance to live again. In your name I pray. So we close. We have an altar. Whatever your response is, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask our some of our spiritual leaders in the house, whether they're students or staff or faculty, to come here and stand. And maybe you, those two prayers, they fall on all of us. Let's just stand together, okay? Those two prayers fall on all of us, I believe. So you as a Christian, as a believer today, you may be going through a season of, 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 of preparation of, and of frustration. And you say, God, today I, I, need, I need courage. I'm asking you to come. Thank you.